In the general election of 1885, Parnell was forced to compromise on his, I suppose, his integrity, his leadership of the Irish Parliamentary Party by imposing Captain Willie O'Shea, the husband of the woman he loved, Catherine O'Shea, on the electors of County Galway because the Home Rule constituency party there did not want this man. They did not know him, they did not like him, they did not want him. And Joseph Bigger, one of Parnell's chief loyalists, did everything that he could to try and block O'Shea's candidacy. And Parnell was forced to visit Galway himself and plead with them, beg with them, to allow O'Shea to be put on the ticket and then to vote for him. And Bigger still refused, but finally, there was no choice and O'Shea was elected. And Bigger said at the time that he found the Parnell-O'Shea connection a disgusting one. And he said, unless the former ends it, his ruin and that of all the leadership will follow. I wish the party to be ruled by Mr. Parnell, but not by Mrs. O'Shea. And those words were to prove prophetic. In 1886, uh, as a result of, the, of Parnell and his party holding the balance of power, Gladstone was forced to bring in a Home Rule Act. And Parnell was asked at the time, in Parliament directly, do you consider this the final settlement or will you want more? Because this was granting Ireland her own Parliament, it was granting Ireland a role within the British Empire, but it wasn't granting the Irish Republic or the full independence that the Fenians wanted. And Parnell said yes. I accept this as the final settlement. But although it passed uh, in an early reading, it was defeated by 40 votes in the House of Commons. And that was the end of the first Home Rule Bill. <coughs> and when you look at what Parnell thought of Gladstone at this time, when he was asked, do you like him? Do you get on with him? He said, no. I look upon Gladstone as I look at all the English people. They will do what we can make them do. And that was how he viewed these things. In the wake of the failure of the Home Rule Bill, what the Home Rule Bill's failure showed was that Gladstone could not control all of his Liberal MPs. Not all of them would vote for the measure. The, the Conservatives were all against it. Lord Randolph Churchill, the father of Winston Churchill, went to Ulster and mobilised uh, the Ulster Unionists against it, saying Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. Uh, there were chance that uh, home rule would mean Rome rule and not all the Liberals were prepared to support it. They didn't have the tight party controls that Parnell had. Parnell had revolutionised party politics. He paid his MPs a salary, something that didn't happen in England until 1911. So he had a tight unit, except for Willie O'Shea. Uh, the Liberals did not. And so the Home Rule Bill was rejected. And for the next number of years, Parnell actually withdrew from politics. He didn't attend the Parliament very often. He didn't attend very me many, many meetings in Ireland or in Britain. Various reasons have been given for that. His health was poor. He was ill for a lot of this time. He was also building a life at home with Catherine O'Shea. They had a number of children. One of them uh, was born while he was in Kilmainham jail a child who was very ill, a young girl, and it was one of the reasons why he wanted to sign that treaty and be released, uh, so that he could uh, comfort Catherine uh, and see the child before she died. And he went over and met them in Paris shortly before the girl died. Uh, so he was building a, a life at home, and he was happy, domesticated. Uh, he, his health wasn't good, his, his finances weren't good, but also he wasn't really sure where the movement would go next. And he was kind of directed out of this uh, semi-retirement in 1887 by a shocking series of articles that were published in the London Times newspaper. Under the heading Parnellism and Crime, it alleged that Charles Stuart Parnell was really a secret Fenian. That if he hadn't quite authorised the murder of uh, Cavendish and Burke by the Invincibles in 1881, he had certainly sympathised with those murders. And they published a letter signed by Parnell, which showed that he had supported the murder of the second man, Burke. And suddenly there was an outcry. 
suddenly Parnell was accused of being a supporter of terror acts, a, a violent insurrectionist, someone who should be arrested and put in jail, and his whole career hung in the balance. And Parnell went public and he said, that letter is a damn lie, it's a forgery. This is a smear campaign by the London Times newspaper. I want a royal commission. I want an investigation. And the government wanted a commission because they had to investigate this. These were serious charges. These were charges that could destroy his career and the careers of the other parliamentary party MPs. And so there was a royal commission. There was an investigation. And the London Times was asked, where had they got this letter? Where had they got all of their evidence? And they were told, well, we purchased the letters from Richard Pickett. Now, Richard Pickett was a newspaper proprietor. He had been a huge friend of the Home Rule movement. He'd been a friend of Butt. But as the 1880s went on, he became alienated from the movement. He became alienated from Parnell. He had become bitter. So he didn't seem like a very reliable witness. And in the cross-examination, Parnell began attending these meetings and Parnell decided we have to do everything that we can to expose this lie. And the cross-examination of Piggott on the witness stand uh, ensured that everything unraveled because the brilliant lawyer who, who questioned Piggott got him to spell out a few words, testing his handwriting. And then everything unraveled because Piggott had spelt the word hesitancy incorrectly. And in the letter, supposedly from Parnell, the word hesitancy had been spelt incorrectly. And the letter or had been done in a certain way with a twist. And that was exactly the way Piggott did it. And Piggott crumbled. He fell apart on the witness stand and he ran off and immediately signed a confession uh, saying that he had forged the letter. He had uh, done it all to destroy Parnell. And Parnell was exonerated. Piggott fled. Piggott was arrested. He fled then. Uh, he escaped. He fled to Europe. And he went to Madrid in Spain, where he took out a gun and blew out his brains. And with the death of Piggott, Parnell was exonerated. Parnell was vindicated. Parnell had said this was a lie, and it was a lie. That this was a smear campaign, and it had been exposed as a smear campaign. And Parnell returned to the House of Commons a hero. And everyone stood up and gave him a standing ovation. It was something unparalleled in the history of the British House of Commons, that this was the man who had been smeared and now had been vindicated. And they all stood up to cheer him as he made his way down to his seat. And Parnell, cold, aloof, proud, did not acknowledge anyone. He did not look right, he did not look left, he did not smile, he did not shake hands with anyone, he just walked like the uncrowned King of Ireland down to his seat. And Gladstone, reflecting on this incredible act of self-control, said he really is an intellectual phenomenon. And now Parnell was at the height of his reputation, the height of his powers. Funnily enough, he didn't believe that Piggott was the forger. Uh, until all the evidence got. When, when he was told about it, he said, it can't be Piggott, it can't be. I've always thought it must be Willie O'Shea uh, because the relationship was tense, it was difficult, uh, and he thought he knew O'Shea was his enemy and that, uh, and that he was working against him. The question might be asked, why didn't Captain Willie O'Shea and Catherine O'Shea just get a divorce? because Willie O'Shea refused. Catherine O'Shea had a very rich aunt. She was elderly, she was ill, and he was waiting for her to die so he would get the vast inheritance. She died in 1889, but immediately other relatives contested the will, and it looked like the whole thing would be caught up in the law courts for decades. And now Willie O'Shea acted. He went to Parnell and said, I'm going to get a divorce unless you pay me £20,000. I want my inheritance. I want the money I've been waiting for. Parnell didn't have the money. Catherine O'Shea didn't have the money. And he was too proud to find the money elsewhere. And so no deal was done. And Catherine O'Shea was, was then, it was over. 
Captain William O'Shea sued for divorce, named Parnell as co-respondent, named Parnell as the man who was having an affair with his wife. They were going to be the grands for the divorce. And that dragged on into 1890. And in 1890 then, the divorce was granted. Parnell and Catherine weren't able to deny those charges. Uh, they were, after all, true. And so now, the affair was public. And everything began to unravel for Parnell. Gladstone turned against him. He wrote a letter to his friend John Morley, where he said that his leadership of the Liberals would be a nullity if this was allowed. And then he published that letter. So in other words, he was giving now an ultimatum to the Irish Parliamentary Party. If you ever want to have home rule, if you ever want to be successful, you must get rid of Parnell. I will not negotiate with him. I will not deal with him. I will not have anything to do with him. And that was hypocrisy of the highest order because he had known about this relationship for the entire 10 years. The Irish public was divided bitterly divided, and the Catholic bishops came out against Parnell. And that proved decisive and turned the party against him. And suddenly then, the parliamentary party was faced with a bitter choice. Should they stand by their leader? Or should they stand by home rule? And some people, some of his friends, wrote to Parnell saying, resign, remarry, return. But he said, no, if I go, I go forever. He realised it would probably be impossible to return. And so the Irish Parliamentary Party met in Committee Room 15 in the House of Commons to discuss all of this. And for five days they debated what they should do. And Parnell issued a challenge to uh, his supporters. He said, the question here is about who is going to be the master of the party. Is it me or is it Gladstone? Are you going to be dictated by him? Who is to be the master of the party? And Tim he Healy, who is, had been one of his great lieutenants, but who was now turning against him and would become one of his most vicious enemies, denouncing Kitty O'Shea, as he called her, all around the country. He stood up and he said, the question is not to be who is to be the master of the party, but who is to be its mistress. And there was a hush. And Parnell stood up and with a fury said, how dare you insult a woman here? Have we gone that low? Have we stooped that low that we will insult a woman's name? But the party split. 44 walked out and they formed a new party, a splinter party. And uh, John Dillon was the leader there. And uh, 28 remained under John Redmond and a new party formed there. And the Home Rule Party was shattered, the unity was shattered, and it was shattered for over a decade. And Parnell now faced the most difficult time of his career. Three members uh, uh, had lost their seats through death and through other reasons. And so three by-elections were call called in Ireland. And the anti-Parnellites put up a candidate. The pro-Parnellites put up a candidate. And so Parnell was forced to fight for his political future by travelling around the country to campaign for these candidates. And along the way, he had to put up with all of the abuse being hurled at him. The taunts about Kitty O'Shea. At Castle Comer, a rock was thrown at his head. And the bitterness caused by the Parnell split well, it reverberated for generations in Irish history. W.B. Yeats later wrote a poem about it called Come Gather Round Me Parnellites. And in it, it got at the heart of all of these problems. It began, come gather round me Parnellites and praise our chosen man. Stand upright on your legs a while, stand upright while you can. For soon we lie where he is laid and he is underground. Come fill up all those glasses and pass the bottle round. And here's a cogent reason, and I have many more. He fought the might of England and saved the Irish poor. Whatever his goods a farmer's got, he brought it all to pass. And here's another reason that Parnell loved a lass. And here's a final reason he was of such a kind. Every man that sings a song keeps Parnell in his mind. For Parnell was a proud man, no prouder trod the ground. And a proud man's a lovely man, so pass the bottle round. The bishops and the party, that tragic story made. A husband that had sold his wife and after that betrayed. 
but stories that live longest are sung above the glass. And Parnell loved his country, and Parnell loved his lass.